the classic Henry Ford production line. He borrowed that from a slaughterhouse in Chicago. But instead of having cars on a pulley that built, they had cows on a pulley that were dismantled. He just reversed it. The radical innovation of Henry Ford was like, it's just a butcher's disassembly line in reverse. Why did you put a picture of a half-eaten chocolate bar in your book? A really great, great question. That's deep in the book when we're talking about triggering action, how we can get people to, to respond. Um, and the, the chocolate bar in uh, itself is a Kit Kat. And everyone knows how you eat a Kit Kat. You eat it sort of finger by, by finger. <laughs> but the image that you're referring to is an image of someone taking a big hunk out of the end. <laughs> and it sort of breaks the pattern. You know, and it's a bit like someone <laughs> scratching their nails down a chalkboard. You know, and it's like breaking the pattern. Like that's not the rule. You know, and we know how to eat a we know how to eat a Kit Kat. And, and that's an example of of sort of the brain's patternicity. I mean, we we love we see the world in, in we see the world in patterns. Randomness doesn't make any sort of benefit to to our our, our, our survival. So spotting patterns and following these systems make a, a lot of sense. And if we can deviate from that, we can help people to, to sort of write it. Um, so so the chocolate bar in 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 question leads itself to a wonderful piece of behavioural design um, by a designer called Louvre Brooms, who created a light switch. And the intention of the light switch was to encourage, to sort of nudge people to, to switch the lights off. Uh, and, and he did this by creating a light switch that when the lights are off, it makes a beautiful zebra pattern. In. But as soon as you switch the light on, it breaks the pattern. It's a bit like biting the end of a Kit Kat. It's just not how it's meant to be. So you're forever sort of feeling this sense of discomfort and are, and are inclined to turn the lights off again. So that's, the, that's why there's an image of a, of a half-eaten chocolate bar in the book. What job does evolution have in the world of marketing and consumer behavior? It plays a huge role, and I think in two fronts. One, in, in understanding um, that much of what we're seeking to influence is, is evolved in its nature, desire, status, all of these are sort of evolutionary drivers. The the, the path I take uh, in, the, in the book Evolutionary Ideas is more so that ideas – also evolve, just as we see biological evolution that adapts and, and, and some solutions prevail and some become extinct, and we can see patterns in these solutions in biology, we can also see these patterns in ideas. And if you understand um, the, the patterns and you understand the solutions that those patterns provide us, then we can draw upon them to be more efficient in our, in our marketing and, 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 and more creative in, in our marketing, I believe, too. I quite like the insight that novel problems don't require novel solutions. There's this quote from Thomas Edison that says, your idea needs to only be original in its adaptation to your problem, which is lovely because you think there are a lot of cross-category solutions that somebody in an airline has come up with that could be used by a person that's trying to start a cleaning business or whatever that's it might right. be. And um, yeah, it, it does seem like there is a pedestalization of big innovation rather than incremental uh, and definitely cross-category stuff as well. Absolutely. And, and two, two reasons for, for, for this. One is um, that we have a sort of a proportionality. We have this assumption that big re problems require big solutions. Um, if we hear in the, in the physical world, if we hear a loud bang, <laughs> we assume that it required a loud sort of a, a large input by which to make the bang. Um, a wonderful, I think it was a 60s study, but it was looking at crabs plays in casinos where you roll the dice. And they found that if people needed a high number, they were more likely to roll the dice harder. And if you needed a, a low number, you roll it softly. Really lovely example of proportionality. So this assumption that it's great, hey, it's why we thought it's so hard for us to believe that mosquitoes can cause something as catastrophic as yellow fever. How can something so small cause something so big? But in the world of ideas and psychology, Ecology certainly can. Big, big sort of outcomes can be caused by small solutions, and that's a big argument for sort of nudge theory, and that's been written a lot in innovation and behavioral science. But what I get really interested in is that a solution or a problem that might feel novel to you is likely not novel to someone else in another category. And as you say, Chris, we're so blinded by the industry that we're in and often the category tropes that we're defined by that we don't look outside the category. And, and we've needed a sort of a bit of connective tissue to help us to go there. I mean, what, what's, why would Castrol Motor Oil ever seek 
advice or inspiration from Gatorade or Powerade, right? And I, I've, I've worked with, with, with business like Castrol in the past looking at engine lubricants, and we did creative reviews of Shell Helix and Valvoline and all the lubricant categories to see what they're doing creatively that year. But we'd never look at Powerade. But if we understood that both are in the same, they're, they're faced with the same challenge, we need to convince people to pay a premium for a product that they can't see is actually working. It's, it's, it's doing its magic behind closed doors because of some magic secret ingredient, whether that's an iron four molecule for Powerade or Magnatech for Castrol, we're talking about the same human challenge here. So let's, let's give ourselves an excuse to sort of expand our, our scope of inspiration outside the category that we're in. Is that the superpower of being an agency that works outside of companies? A marketing department that's held within a particular business itself is going to be much more siloed. For, for me, that is, and that's I mean, that's one of the most enjoyable parts I think of working in an agency. But I remember years ago, um, and I can't remember the exact nature of the, the, the challenge. But my old boss, Mark Saraf, the um, strategy um, head of, of Ogilvy in Australia, and we're working on Uncle Toby's oats. Right, so it's like classic Australian down to earth oats. And and we sat down. I remember where we we're sitting. I don't remember the problem. But he said, "I've seen the same problem for Jaguar." And I remember when when and I was very junior into the business. I thought, "Well, firstly, well this." guys worked on Jaguar how awesome is that but the fact that he had the exposure to so many brands and challenges that he could connect a challenge for rolled oats with one that he's seen for for, for Jaguar premium sports cars and and I think that's um that's a, a a blessing of being in an agency but it's also something I think if you make it part of your job to seek sort of cross-category challenges and, and cross-category solutions so you can bring them to spaces that they otherwise wouldn't belong and that goes back to what I was speaking about, that, that connective tissue, what helps us to, to define the area of exploration and to justify why we can bring that solution into a category that it might never be seen before. To draw this across to evolution, I think you make a parallel between Gatorade and Castrol and dolphins and sharks. The fact that yes. dolphins are mammals... Yes. Yes, and sharks are fish, but both of them independently came upon the dorsal fin, the thing right. at the top. I don't know what it does. Presumably, it's steer. Is that what they steer with? Stabilizes, stabilizes the shark and the dolphin. And, you, and you're right. So both, both sort of two categorically different species of animal, under the same environmental constraints. Right, the need to survive, swim fast, capture prey in water. Could, what the, the term is convergently evolved on the dorsal fin. Um, so we can start to see two different species have done this in nature. How might we see two different species of organization do that when faced with the same challenge? It's not water, but it could be triggering action like we've spoken about. It could be enhancing loyalty. This is the, and, and what sort of constraints does that pose us? And therefore, what, what have we convergently upholded, uh, stumbled upon in, in, in other industries and categories? The issue that you have in evolution is that the animals can't look at the features that other animals have and said, "Oh, that looks, that looks, that all looks right. great." Yeah, I'll have a bit of that. Whereas, <laughs> obviously, in business and marketing, you can do that. We can, yeah, precisely. Can. So, a, an example from my industry: I ran nightclubs for a very long time, and one of the things that you're trying to do there is generate excitement, anticipation engagement, trust, social cohesion, mm -hmm. status, all of that from basically nothing. It, yes. uh, Rory's idea of alchemy, this is whatever one step before that is. This is me creating something from nothing. This is like Big Bang yes. Theory because every different venue is doing the same thing. No matter how much you try and yes. dress up nightlife, it is people getting drunk in a room to music. That's it. And there, yes. you can change the price points and change the music and change the branding and do the whatever. And what we found, this was an insight I got from evolutionary psychology, actually, the fact that humans are anticipatory beings and a lot of the time, it seems like we enjoy our anticipation of the event sometimes more than the actual event itself. So mm -hmm. what we started to do in advance of Freshers' Week when all of the new students would arrive, we would bring out these really protracted um, launch sequences. Let's say that we're about to release a new event. We've got this new event that's coming up and it's going to be fun. We would do something big is coming teaser eight weeks before the event. Then 
maybe the venue that it's going to be at or the day that it's going to be on seven weeks before and then there would be a full release video that's coming and people would know when the full release video was coming and then just this really drawn out launch procedure and then in the build-up to that as well we might release the room one djs and the room two djs and then they we're going to have this thing and this thing and this thing and i found that it really generated excitement and anticipation out of nowhere and that's something that I've drawn across for the podcast as well. Now that I apply that, so this is cross category too for me, I guess. If I have a big yeah. guest coming up, let's say that I'm bringing Jordan Peterson on the show, I'll tell people that I'm going to record with him two months before he comes on the show. Yeah, 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 and yeah. then there'll be a photo from behind the scenes and then there'll be a countdown timer that's going to happen until the, the episode goes live and stuff like that. People need stuff to look forward to. And this is for yes. anybody that's trying to release anything, whether you're a personal trainer that's releasing a new plan online or whatever. I really, really think that the power of a protracted build-up sequence to it, really, as long as you don't do it too frequently, because then you get burnout and it starts to seem a little yes. bit sort of tarnished. Same old, same old. Yep. Yeah. But if you use it, I would say maximum of once per six months, I reckon that you can get away with that kind of frequency and it just builds engagement and people are genuinely bought in they're like oh this is kind of a narrative it's sort of like a soap opera and i know what's going on and i'm excited it's that's my uh, equivalent example and you're and you're right and and neuroimaging studies have looked at the brain's experience of pleasure and actually the anticipation of is just as valuable it lights up our brain just as much as the receiving of the reward right and it's why concepts like variable reward are so important that sometimes you win and sometimes you don't because it's actually about the hunger for the for the for the next for the next bit of of, of success another way to think of it might be what what helps you and i love this sort of conjuring value out of out of nowhere or finding something that speaks volumes that is that that, that needs not sort of be, be be written in longhand and that's where sort of signaling can can help too like what's the what's the powerful signal that speaks that says everything i mean uh, i explore that in the book around trust i mean what you're saying is i like, is is my money going to be do i trust that this is a genuine a, a genuine big night out is this where actually everyone in the uni is going to go or am i going to be stuck at that because this is a big choice to make right um so it's really about endearing trust and 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 there are wonderful examples of of uh, Sort of lateral signals that you can draw upon, whether it's canaries going down coal mines that signal the fact that there's pollute, sort of toxic air under under underground before the miners, all the way through to Van Halen, um, putting a, a, a clause in their in their rider the, the band had a clause for the, the setup of their of their of their concerts that covered everything from the lighting to the tuning of the guitar. Uh, and just to make sure that the, the the band promoters and the people setting up had had followed the rules explicitly. Let me let me give you my clause, let me let me give you my favorite um, band rider. Now I want to say it was Red Hot Chili Peppers, but it might be somebody else. So people that aren't used to live shows might not know this, but there's t- typically two riders that a artist will have one will be the tech rider and the other will be the hospitality rider tech rider is all of the specifics about the distance that they need to be and the type of ampage and the staging and the lighting and the hospitality rider is exactly as it says it's we need two ounces of the best local weed and we need four bottles of champagne and we want a fruit bowl and we want blah 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 anyway in the hospitality rider this particular artist had put that they wanted a bowl of m&ms but they wanted none of the blue ones in they wanted all of the blue ones taking out and what they did was they used the blue m&m test as a rough heuristic for how much they needed to scrutinize the rest of the rider because if they went in the first thing that they would look at in the hospitality room was are there any blue M&Ms in the bowl? If there were no blue M&Ms in the bowl, they can probably relax because if the guys have taken blue M&Ms out, they're going to have the right amps out front. They're going to have the right video screen. So cool. So Genius. smart. Genius. And it was, and, that, and that's, it's, it's, um, the, the example I was speaking is Van Halen. And they wrote it as a clause, you know, and and it means that you can see one thing, and it says everything. I don't have to bother looking at anything else. A good mate of mine um, sells wedding dresses, and he told me we've just started. Like when we send people the dress, we've just given them like gloves to like handle it with. And I love like just white gloves. It probably cost about fifty p for a pair of white gloves when you when you buy them on mass. And for me, that's just such an awesome piece of of marketing that just says, "Wow, this is amazing material. Don't touch this." not wearing gloves and it's simple things like that, that that again we can look at a canary in a coal mine we can borrow from a, a van halen rider we can look at 
gloves in a, in a wedding dress package and think, well, what's the example of that for a big night out? I mean, how much, like, what's the, what's the, the uh, I won't try and tap dance on the front here, but it's like, what's the, 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 the police investigation that's ongoing from the year before? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, well, I mean, that's so kind a, of what you want. An example of what we could use and what a lot of clubs have used in the past is uh, slowing entry to extend the queue. A queue yes. is a hard to fake signal of popularity. It's a yes. social status uh, amplifier, I guess. And as people walk past, they go, oh, bloody hell. Look at this. Yeah. Look at the size of that. I mean, there's got to be something. Yes. And we always take photos and you make sure that there's a photo of the queue because, and obviously people then do queue packing, which is to make the queue thinner. You can actually take it from a, a four wide queue to a three wide queue or a That's two cool. and a half wide queue, yes, which will yes, actually yes. extend it out. And if you never, if you take the photo exactly from the side, you can't see how deep it is. So there's all yes. manner of fuckery that's going on in an effort yeah, yeah, to try. Yeah, and... again, it's about trust. Again, yep. it's about trust and, and, and providing social. It's like a testimonial on, a, on an Amazon website. It's like a five star rating. It's like thousands of that helps in 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 gender trust and and uh, i mean filling restaurants from the front windows back you know and so you're walking past they look busy like these are things that these are things that we've done intuitively for eons in nightclubs in restaurants on 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 online discount stores um but if we understand that the term for that or the 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 codified idea is social proof or social norm or if we're talking about a, a brown m m clause being as a signal then we can start to help to, to sort of again define the area of investigation that we should explore and for me that's what behavioral science has done it's given us this this language this codification that can help us more easily navigate evolved ideas once we can see them then the challenge is missing them <laughs> It becomes an affliction. You start to sort of see these examples everywhere. I flew back from Rome a couple of days ago with my mum, and one of the things that I was looking at was the printed ticket that I had. And I, 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 lots of people will be checking in online, but if you do end up getting a printed ticket, the volume of information that's on there is absolutely insane. And I saw in your book that someone had simplified that by creating a sleeve that you slot the ticket into and it refines down all of this information and it creates yes. little windows and over the windows are gate, boarding time, seat number, perhaps, something like that. First off, I do need to ask the question of why in a world where you get an iPhone in a case that has no instruction manual and no nothing else, you know, it's really the, the entire process has been refined and it's beautiful, why it is that all of this information needs to be printed on a piece of ticket. Yeah, it, yeah, it yeah. seems completely stupid, but I like the idea of the simplification there. But it's a halfway point. I mean, there's a, and there's a, it's a, there's been a lot on online recently about sort of human centric plane tickets and how we might change them and provide imagery because I mean, airports are a wonderful context for behavioural scientists because you can never assume that language is a constant. You're speaking to people under stress and pressure, you know, where our sort of attentional resources are, are, are channeled. So it's a, a really, a really wonderful space. Um, but I, I love that example as, as, a, as a hack. I mean, it's a midway point. But I use that in the book as an example, again, as just like the dolphin and the shark have converged upon the same solution. You, uh, the, 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 the image above that in the book is of a, of, a, um, of a remote controller for a TV that someone's probably gone around to their nan's house <laughs> who keeps keeps turning on the Korean news and wondering how on earth can I get back to BBC One? And, and they've literally just taped over all the buttons not to use. So they've simplified the remote control as a bit of a hack. Um, and Qatar always did it on purpose. And so in two different industries, addressing the challenge of complexity reduction they've sort of convergently evolved on the same solution and i it's a, it, you, you stumble across these in, in 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 lots of different realms and it's um it's a fun space what was the problem with google glass well, the problem with google glass i think is they were they were more hung up with the 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 ability of integrating technology that they missed the the some of the social challenges that they would be faced with not being able to see what the person in front of you might be looking at or exploring. I sort of quip in the book, like it just takes one one trip to the bathroom, live streaming a trip to the urinal, and that's the end of that's the end of Google Glass. So it was sort of very focused on 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 specs and engineering solutions and the wonders of technology that have failed to address some of the the the, the larger challenges of, of our evolved psychology of 
privacy, of, of trust, of purpose. What's interesting with Google Glass, I think once you've started to sort of shift it from being a, an all-encompassing social tool to a purposeful production aid, like, so I think Google Glass is now or similar technology is used in production roles. Um, it's 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 done to spike interest again, giving it a sort of a clearly defined role. So you can address that the technology is still valuable if you give it a purpose. Um, and so that's one. And certainly in the early days of Google Glass, that, that that tripped them up. What are people using it for in production? I think they're using it to look at. Um, in I've I've read an article about sort of um, like car manufacturing, so they can see. Um, that they're able to identify parts and, and order parts on the spot. It's it's this is to be used for that outcome. Um, then people are more comfortable wearing it for for a shorter period of time for for a clear outcome. Didn't you guys do something in Connecticut where you were trying to reduce people chopping their fingers off and dropping heavy stuff on their feet? That was in a warehouse or something as well. That's right. That was in a big a big factory in in Connecticut. What was that? What do you do? Yeah, well, so so that was um, so we're looking. It was safety. It was safety as a as a as a, as a key challenge, um, and and it's one of the examples is a great for, for me. It's a great example of an evolved idea. Um, one of the problems when we move into into factories and, and factory safety is that we're talking about individuals who work long shifts over a long amount of time with what is often high repetition work. Um, so every time we went to a factory, I think someone received like a 30-year a, a milestone. So we're talking about like people who are working in the same factory for a long time, doing quite specific tasks. And the challenge with safety and risk-taking is the more familiar you are within an environment, the more risks you take. You sort of switch off a little bit. I think a, a third of car accidents occurred a, a mile from your home i mean we can all sort of identify that we just we're already like halfway sort of taking the tie off and and and, and getting ready for we sort of our, our brain switches off uh, and this is a problem obviously in factories when irrespective of your familiarity that circular source is still going to chop off your fingers um so what we actually borrowed from so the so the, the step to the side was some insights around boxes um, and uh, actually, with the the Rio Olympics were the first Olympics to ban men from wearing headgear in boxing because they found actually men are more likely to put themselves in a vulnerable position, more likely to actually experience a concussion if you had a headgear on. Uh, so they changed the policy in Rio to actually remove the headgears and in, in the recent Commonwealth Games that watched again and 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 the men didn't have 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 headgear on. Um, so, so what we needed to do actually is pose a, a, a challenging question to heads of health and safety. Rather than saying, how can we keep your workers safe? question was how can we make your workers feel at greater risk feel a bit more exposed right? if you could get someone to feel more exposed you're sort of naturally more likely to take care of yourself so what we did was develop a series of, of personal protective equipment that had so if we're looking at gloves we created a, se a set of gloves that had skeletons on the outside so you could see just it, it, it removed the the um the sense of your fingers being an extension of the tool and a reminder that it is a vulnerable extension of you. Um, and, and we ran some experiments. It, 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 working in safety is a, a fascinating area that is, I think there's a lot of work for psychology and creativity in safety. It's just a, a space that sometimes you would never expect Ogilvy to be in, 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 in these kinds of spaces, but there's a huge role for us. Um, and we found that, um, people wearing, in this experimental paradigm, people wearing um, the gloves were more likely to feel vulnerable. So we were able to have a correlation between vulnerability and risk-taking. So those that wore the gloves were more likely to feel vulnerable. Um, and those who wore the gloves were um, felt um, a, a, a greater risk of, of, of cuts from um, like low-level injury, like a box cutter, for example which sort of makes sense if you're looking at a circular saw you're still going to chop your fingers off it's not going to it's not going to, you're in but actually it, it sort of we had a medical grade significance looking at, at at different injuries compared to just normal hands and compared to normal gloves so it's again a nice small shift borrowed from boxing that we can bring into into safety what about humpback whales you looked at them Humpback whales. We looked at so, so humpback whales is is an example in 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 the book I explore of of biomimicry, 
um, if I'm talking about the, 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 the same example, Chris, tell me if, if not, so humpback whales um, have been a, a, a piece of inspiration for a business called Whale Power. Um, so Whale Power is a, an organization that have found that you can create wind turbines that increase the lift and reduce the drag if you borrow from the shape of humpback whale fins that have these things called tubercles on them. They have these little bumps. Um, so it's a lovely example of the field of, of biomimicry. And we mentioned before that um, animals can't look at each other and go, oh, I'd like a bit of those feathers. <laughs> You're like, oh, I could do some damage with that beak if only, if only I had that beak. Um, that they can't do it, but we can. You know, and so, so biomimicry is a whole field that looks at borrowing, stealing from evolved biology in nature and, and adapting it to human problems, whether that's a wind turbine like a humpback whale, whether that's um, looking at mosquito probisci to make pain-free needles, whether it's- No way, at, is that uh, what they did? It's, it's cool, man. And, and looking at the hair of rabbits to create air cooling systems, more efficient air cooling systems. Um, so it's, it's one of those, one, I mean, it's a deep vortex if you get into it, but it's <laughs> it's super cool. And, and, and for me, discovering biomimicry was the trigger for the book. So I thought, so biomimicry in design, in, in architecture, all the way back to Velcro being inspired by the spurs um, on, on, on a dog. Is that where it um, came from? The, yeah, yeah. So I always forget the name of the gentleman who was walking his dog every day and kept having to, to, to remove the spurs, looked at them under the microscope and, and invented Velcro. So all these things that feel like groundbreaking revolutionary innovation, right, um, is actually an adapted solution. Um, the, 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 the classic Henry Ford production line was just a, um, he, he, he borrowed that from a, a, a slaughterhouse in Chicago. But instead of having cars on a pulley that built, they had cows on a pulley that were dismantled. He just reversed it. <laughs> and again, it's like the, 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 the radical innovation of Henry Ford. It's like it's just a, a butcher's disassembly line in reverse. So biomimicry is, is, a, is a, a big stepping off point for, for evolutionary ideas. But again, instead of borrowing from biological solutions like the hair of a jackrabbit or the, 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 the beak of a kingfisher to make the, the Shinkansen 500 uh, more, more efficient going through, through tunnels, we look at evolved psychological solutions. So we look at the, the cognitive realm and what we can borrow from that. What was the problem with the bullet train before they fixed it? So the problem with the bullet train was actually a, a, a sound problem. Um, so the challenge was to um, reduce the time that, uh, and, and this is the Shinkansen five, uh, the Shinkansen line that, that stretches between Tokyo and Osaka. Um, so the challenge was set to reduce the time that it took the train to, 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 to pass that distance. They had um, experimental cars that could actually drive fast enough to manage it, but the faster the carts went, the more loud, the, the, the more noise they produced. Um, so it became an auditory challenge, not a not a speed challenge. Um, so uh, there, there were two main main problems on, on the Shinkansen. The first was a, a part of the train known as the pantograph. So it connects the train to the wires overhead. And as the train increased its speed, it, it gave a sort of a loud whooshing sound because of the turbulence created by these, these sort of essentially what are wings on top. So what they did, uh, and a gentleman called Ejai Natkatsu, um, was in charge of the of the of the program, um, and he was a fortunately an avid bird watcher, so fascinated with birds and fascinated with engineering. And these two loves came together on on this project. So to reduce the the sound of the on the pantograph, what they did was borrow from the owl. So the feathers of an owl. So the owl's an, a nocturnal predator. It's evolved to be able to sort of swoop down in darkness and stun its prey in virtual silence. So it's, and it does this because of what's known as micro serrations on its feathers. So if you imagine the sort of small serrations on the feathers that chop up the turbulence. So instead of having this large whooshing sound, now you created these micro turbulences that, that dissipated the sound. So essentially they created micro serrations on the pantograph. Uh, and, and the second bird of influence on the pantograph was the Adelie penguin. So it's that's what's, what's known as a spindle shape, a bit like a football. You know, those tiny penguins that you often see sort of trying to escape a leopard seal. That's an Adelie. And they borrowed from the shape of the Adelie of, of, to, to, to shape the pantograph and, and, and address that specific um, issue. Um, but the second problem on, on the Shinkansen was um, the many tunnels um, that exist on the line. So again, a bit like a, a, a shark and a dolphin have to address the environmental constraint of water, this train needed to address the environmental constraint of like a series of tunnels. How can we penetrate a series of tunnels without creating what's known as a tunnel boom? It's a bit like a, 
a shot of a gun, a pistol being fired. Um, and in this instance, that this is where they borrowed from the kingfisher. So the kingfisher beak has evolved uh, over, over a millennia to have a really interesting sort of diamond shape. So it's got a really smooth um, angle from the, the sort of the, the head to the tip of the beak, but it does so in an interesting diamond shape. Um, and it's able to, because of this, it's able to sort of go from the air to the water to stun its prey. I think it's a substance like 800 times denser with, without, a, without an issue. So by, again, adapting the shape of the kingfisher beak onto the Shinkansen, they overcame the challenge of the, of the tunnel booms. So it's a, and, and I love that story. Again, it's a, a classic example of biomimicry, but it shows that that we can do this on purpose. Um, but the, the the issue with this narrative is that if it wasn't for the gentleman Ejai Katsu, that might not have happened. I mean, someone who was who was sort of deep into to his understanding of, of birds, how can we make this more systematic? So it's not just so we were able to link if you've got a if you've got a challenge with aerodynamics, here's a battery of solutions that you can explore that are, that address this. Um, whether we have time or, or interest to ex explore, but the next stepping stone then is is looking at systematic innovation of evolutionary solutions, uh, and that story um, is a, is an engineering story, um, and a gentleman called Genrik Outschuler, who was a, a Soviet inventor. Um, w was quickly um, sort of snapped up by the, the, the Russian Navy in the Stalinist period um, to, to work in their innovation hub and, and, and essentially was looking at patents all day, going through the, 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 the Naval Innovation Hub and said, all these, none of these are, are, are innovations. You mean? Um, these, are, these are all just similar solutions to problems in different disparate parts of the Navy. Uh, and he since then worked with some colleagues to assess 200,000 patents and identified them on their level of, of inventiveness and found that like, as little as 1% is sort of true innovation. But what Altshuler did in his model TRIZ um, was start to then map out these patterns of solutions. So just as you can have species of animals that are codified by the presence of a spinal cord or warm blood or gills, he started to do it with engineering solutions. So one inventive principle is the concept of a nested doll, a bit like a, a, a classic Russian doll. Um, and if you imagine that, then you can start to think of a telescopic camera lens is an example of a nested doll. A retractable tape measure is an example of a nested doll. Um, a nail polish that has the brush that goes in the bottle is an example of a nested doll. So we can start to see these patterns of solutions um, in engineering. And the final piece, Chris, before I let, and I'll let you get a word and I promise, is, is how you then bring it together. Um, so what they do in TRIZ is they've created a matrix. Um, and the matrix, the X and the Y axis, look at um, measurable attributes like volume, length, uh, weight, um, uh, durability. Um, and, and, and you can map then, if I'm looking to increase the volume of something without increasing its size, for example, then you look at, at, the, at, the, at the matrix, that'll give you nested doll. So you increase the volume without increasing the size. So you're faced with challenges then, how do I make a, a, an umbrella big enough to cover the human body, but small enough to fit in a handbag? And you look at that on the matrix and it gives you a starting point for innovation. How do I make a bulletproof jacket strong enough to stop a bullet, but not so heavy that people can't wear it. You look at the matrix and it gives you a, a, a sort of a short list of the principles to start from. And that's what we begin to do in evolutionary ideas, again, in psychology. Um, but rather than size and length and weight and volume, we look at things like trust. And we look at things like um, decision making. How do we, how do we, how do we aid decisions without limiting choice? How do we, how do we trigger action without forcing response? How do we boost loyalty without increasing incentives? How do we improve experiences without changing their duration? And for each, similar to TRIZ, we can start to say, well, here are some psychological principles that you should start with. So we go back to our nightclub conundrum. We go, well, that's maybe fundamentally a trust conundrum. And if we look at the chapter on, or the, the, I don't want to keep hammering on about the book, but if we look at the discipline and think about, okay, how do we increase trust without changing the truth? This isn't about lying to people. This is about using what we've got uh, to be more effective. Um, and we look at the inventive principles or the psychological inventive principles. Funnily enough, they're exactly what we've talked about. It's signaling. I mean, what's a small signal that can help increase believability that this is going to be the night of my life? What's social proof? 
you're in. Um, so as you said about uh, cue hacking, or oh, I love the term where you went from four, four, four abreast to one abreast, you're in that social proof of boosting trust. And then the third concept is operational transparency. So anything might be better is having like a live feed or, or, um, or you sort of, you can see here, here are the kegs rolling up right now or, or maybe what you're doing and building anticipation is again making people feel like they can see the work that's happening behind the scenes to help them believe that it's going to be an awesome night I and think, if we can start there then we're away i think that the operational transparency things are an interesting one because part of what you're trying to do is make the event sufficiently exclusive that people can't get access to it without being there so i know operational transparency some examples of that would be a pizzeria that has flour out front on on the window sill or whatever that engenders people to believe that they're making their own dough. They still might be buying it in, but they've just got some yeah, yeah, bags yeah. of flour outside. Uh, but yeah, I, I wonder what um, perhaps operational transparency would have been included in. Here we are booking the DJs, and here we are dressing yes. the venue. Here's some photos yeah. of the decor. You know, this isn't just uh, a, you're going to walk into an empty room. And nothing's going to be going on. Yes. One of the contradictions that you've been talking about there, you say that innov innovation is the resolution of these contradictions. One of the interesting ones that I've been playing around with a lot recently is how to aid decisions without limiting choice because Barry Schwartz is the paradox of choice is something that I can't unsee anymore. And I keep, yes. it just keeps on arising in front of me. For the people that haven't seen it, it's this great TED talk that you should absolutely listen to from maybe 10 or 15 years ago. Barry uses this example of all of the different types of genes that are available now compared with 50 years ago, there was one type of genes. You go in, you buy a type of genes. The utilitarian rationalists would say, well, if you get to have as many choices and options as possible, that allows you to maximize the utility that you can get because it is much more precise toward exactly what you wanted, but it doesn't account for the fact that humans have loss aversion and choice anxiety and all of this stuff that just they can't bear the decision and it causes paralysis by analysis. People walk out of the store having bought no jeans and also feeling ashamed at the fact that they couldn't choose a pair as opposed to going in and just having one. So the paradox of decision versus choice is something I think that is really mm. prevalent given how many decisions and opportunities and options people have now. So what are some of the solutions? How can we help people to make a decision Absolutely. without limiting their choice too much? So, so if we imagine our sort of uh, our matrix then, so if we think of aiding decisions without limiting choice, um, then there are three areas, that, and, and, and this is the, the, the start of the conversation, not the end of the conversation, but three areas we explore looking at, at defaults, looking at, at, at prompts or, or helping people to actually um, sort of guiding people in their decision making and, and finally chunking. So to start with, Defaults. So defaults are. Uh, we often see defaults in, or think about defaults in, sort of subscriptions. So you're automatically subscri subscribe if you say yes. You I mean it's already pre-ticked that box. In most circumstances, we find that. Again, people have sort of overloaded with information that if we can create a system, create an environment that elicits our desired choice or, or an individual's beneficial choice as a direct outcome, then that's setting the default. Um, so I think in, 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 in Disneyland, they changed the default menu on, on the kids' meals from, from chips to apples and from soda to orange juice. I mean, people could still order soda. People could still um, buy, buy chips, but the default, the, the default was, was now apples and juice. And it changed the caloric it's sort of eat, uh, intake significantly just by changing the default, the way that it's set up, and because it requires someone to make an alternative decision. <laughs> and and there's a few things about defaults. One is that it, yes, it's sort of the line of best fit. The other is that it almost feels like it's it's creating a norm. Like if you do this, you're some sort of some sort of deviant. What you want chips for your kids? You, you, you know what I mean? And, he, and even simply like uh, in in the book I reference um, a uh, like a tap faucet in a in a shower somewhere. It's either in in Japan or in the, in the UK. The UK is an amazing place. Every shower is different. I mean, it's, it's, it blows my mind. <laughs> When you go to someone's house in the UK, first thing you need to ask for shower instructions. But it had a single number. It said 38 degrees. You're in 38 degrees, and then it was sort of warmer or colder than that. But it just said 38 degrees. And then you see, like, well, if I don't want 38, like I'm breaking the – what What does that say about me? I mean, so it just creates this assumption that that's the desired outcome. So, so long and short of it is that 
um, to aid decision making without limiting choice, we can start to change the defaults. Um, so that's a default either that 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 helps someone have um, more apples than they do have chips in in a restaurant, all the way through to research that's looked at organ donation and opt in and opt out forms. The, the second area that we explore there in, in decision making is actually starting to to help. Um, pre-fill some of the information for people in advance so people can sort of see uh, or, or, or remove what is a difficult decision. Um, the, the, the example I open up on, um, and it's not the same as Coke or Pepsi kind of choice, it's sort of uh, what am I going to do in this scenario? Um, the example I, I, I start with in the, in the book is an instance um, when a best mate's um, mother sadly passed away and I was about to send flowers and I was sort of at that point in the, the online journey to leave a, a message and I'm terrible at those things um, but there was an option to have just some prompts or some inspiration just a, a couple of small prompts that was like just help kick it off <laughs> just aided that aided that process um, and it was a lovely example of where I, I could have bought flowers gone through with that or I might have been stuck in this paralysis of a different to complexity paralysis, more of a social paralysis. Um, we see that through to young children playing puzzles where we sort of help them to decide which piece goes where by embossing the, the image in the bottom of the puzzle. Um, we can see, oh, that's the giraffe because actually there's a little picture of the giraffe in the space too. I mean, so we can just we can just see that, and that goes all the way through to pre-filling forms for university enrollment. So just giving someone a little nudge in the right direction, or just prompting someone with name or or email rather than two empty boxes. I mean, that's the extreme of it. Um, that that can help us. And the last um, is is around chunking, and I'm racing through these at a, at a million miles an hour, but I want to sort of co cover them if I can. Is looking at chunking. And we can use chunking in two different ways to, to aid decision making. Um, one is sort of as we expect. So, so chunking is a term used to sort of breaking up large pieces of information into small and meaningful chunks. We often see this um, in mobile phone numbers where they're sort of chunked into sort of four digit series. So you sort of remember the pattern. I think the UK postal codes. Uh, 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 I think the, the Royal Mail did a survey that said actually many people find their postcodes more easy to remember than their spouse's birthday or their anniversary. <laughs> they're designed to be memorable based on how they're chunked. But if we think of chunking, I often go to like, how does a restaurant help you aid decisions? You know, and they could just list everything alphabetically. I mean, so you'd have the chicken after the after the beef as i go back to my but, but and then you'd have the the, the ice cream before the the, the um uh, again t tap dancing with examples here, but it doesn't meaningfully chunk up the menu but but what they do do is chunk it up into entrees mains desserts they might even chunk it up into the protein so you have chicken seafood or beef so they chunk it in a meaningful way when you get your um your flat pack from ikea it doesn't just say okay now make it you're in it chunks down the process into to meaningful steps. So that's one way in which we can aid decision, chunking up large pieces of information uh, into smaller meaningful pieces. The, the element of chunking that I find even more interesting is when you actually start to, to make what is a deceptively simple choice a larger decision. So you actually a, add chunks. So um, the, the best example that I've come across of, of this is, is looking at the presumption of innocence in, in legal cases um, and the burden of proof. Uh, and oftentimes you might imagine, well, they're either guilty or not guilty. Uh, but what many um, legal firms do is they actually just map up the, the burden of proof. So it's, it's sort of innocent to highly likely innocent there's a there's a list of sort of nine steps that you need to go through before you actually go to guilty beyond reasonable doubt so it sort of expands this decision making process so you actually need to go through nine levels of innocence before you get to guilt so it's actually sort of chunked up a what seems like a binary decision into a, a multiple multiple stages in the physical realm we see that on the london tube we see that sort of the designated standing areas on the tube um, what is the what is the area that's deemed to be safe, and what is the area that's a little bit dangerous, and what is the sort of the mind the gap? I mean, that's just it's paint. I mean, it's the same. It's it's the it's the same platform, but it's been chunked down in its levels of dangerous. You 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 look at a hypertension chart. They break down normal into low normal and high normal. 
to win. That's almost normal, but they've just created a level of like high normal. So you better start worrying. Like, don't get too complacent here, high normal. <laughs> and and I, and I just, I love that. When, when we discussed about creating value or defining a world to help people to navigate, um, it's, 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 it's a rich, there's a rich world out there. I feel like, I mean, this is the point. I feel like I'm doing a lot of talking here, Chris. I hope it's okay. It's That's why you are here, Sam. That's why you're the specialist. Good. You You've just mentioned about restaurants and restaurant experiences yes. i mentioned that i'd just gone to rome i noticed something for a while that all of my rich friends as soon as they ascended out of the working class and into the lower echelons of the beautiful stratosphere that is the middle class all started drinking sparkling water when we went out for dinner right right, right. And I haven't got a fucking clue what's going on. And I was saying to them, "What? what is it? What is it? Is there some secret Mason society handshake <laughs> thing that goes on where everybody accepts that you've got to start ordering San Pellegrino as soon as you get to the table? And then I found myself, ashamedly, at the start of this year, I found myself ordering a Topo Chico, which is a Mexican sparkling water. And it's if you think that you don't like sparkling water, I challenge you to have a Topo Chico and think that it's not good. Topo Chico. Yeah, that was a, a Petersonian uh, solution because uh, Jordan and Michaela and the rest of their family are allergic to everything. So for them to have an alcoholic drink, they need to have vodka with, well, what can we have it with? We need to have it with something, but water would be insane. But somehow yeah. a vodka Topo Chico just doesn't feel too too ridiculous. My point being, what do you think's going on why is it that rich people like to drink sparkling water? And didn't you look at the top of a San Pellegrino, the lid of a San Pellegrino as well? Yeah, oh, I, I think that, I mean, there could be two sides to this. One is the individual, the other is the restaurant. So I, th I think there's, again, if we're talking about signals of opulence and, and wealth, like paying for water sort of is, 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 is itself, it's like the peacock feather. It's like oh, this waste that I can afford, I mean, is a signal of my gravitas and fitness, right? So at an individual level, <laughs> paying for water might provide sort of more social status than it does hydration. The other side could be actually the restaurants that, um, you frequent with um, if friends in in the, the stratospheric middle class um, have a have a placebo choice. They might say, "Do do you want Perrier or sparkling?" You know, so they don't even offer you tap. So either way, you're having sparkling. You're having you're having bottled water of some sort. Um, so it could be it could be driven by the restaurant, could be driven by the individual. But um, but I, it's it's uh, what's interesting is that it happens. It's predictable, you know, in, and uh, and if you understand whether or not it's again this opulence of um, of of, uh, of of paying for something slightly needlessly, then that provides these that these evolved sort of status cues. And well, again, my background in nightlife, conspicuous consumption was a. Uh, very, very common. You know, the, the biggest bottle of vodka, you, you know that yeah. five, five guys aren't even going to be able to get through half of it by the end of the evening. And it's they're pouring it over their watches or they're giving away glasses for free or they're spraying champagne. This is all conspicuous consumption happening, right? Yeah. And I, I wonder whether, yeah, the the unnecessary, expensive... You see this with Voss. Have you seen, do you know Voss? Yeah, beautiful, beautiful packaging. Yeah, well-designed bottle. It's very yeah. standout. Yeah, yeah, Why yeah. would you need a standout bottle of of water? It's just water. Why isn't it more utilitarian? It's completely circular, which means it's like a, a, a cylinder, which means it's actually yes. quite difficult to pack away. If you were to ever take it anywhere, it would be easier to have something like a Volvic, which has got maybe rounded edges but is more kind of cubic and rectangular. Well, the, the reason is that everybody knows, even if they haven't seen the logo, if they see the silhouette of the bottle, they know that that's a yeah. bottle of water that costs seven pounds. So yes. that makes sense. What did am I right in thinking you looked at something to do with the lid of San Pellegrino, or did I make we, that up? We often explore. We often, uh, um, as a as an organisation, we often talk about the the lid of the San Pellegrino, the 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 costly signal. Again, the the waste of the tin foil on a San Pellegrino. Again, it's it's just a, a a subtle a subtle nod to the fact that we've invested an, enough in this product to justify the investment of a little bit more to have it sealed off with with aluminium. That changed recently. I think they've actually taken away the the the, the tin foil. You've got to save design. the uh, turtles it's, and the tortoises and stuff. We can't be uh, wastefully. Costly or signaling. in some instances, just change the change the bottom line. You know, and it's it's. <laughs> we can um, save if, well, that's if you. I wonder how many companies. Both, I, mean, I wonder how many companies are using 
the eco. I, I've said this for ages. I mean, you must have seen this if you've been traveling anywhere. Hotels are absolutely riding off of... They're playing this perfect balance between COVID and uh, the green movement in order to not yeah. come and clean your room. Like, no, yeah. fuck you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I know why you're doing this. <laughs> you're not doing this because you care about the environment. You're doing this because you've been able to half your cleaning costs over the yes. last three years. Yes. Yeah, yeah, there are two. And, and again, it's... and. Uh, totally, to, 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 I've just just been away actually, and you can see it. And it, it was via the airport, um, which was just madness. I mean, we understand aviation's been hit so hard, but you sort of think about a commercial uh, commercial outcome. But I think for for um, for 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 San Pellegrino, I, uh, I think it's it can be hard on a spreadsheet to justify a useless piece of tinfoil if you don't understand what it does for you at a psychological level. Um, again, it's sometimes we often say sort of that. Marketers wonder where sort of what fifty percent of your your advertising is wasted, and actually the wasted proportion might be the most valuable bit. You know, it shows that you've got money to burn to bring your product. If you've got money to burn to bring your product to the market, then people must be buying it. Um, it's rare for 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 failing products or, or to to have a Super Bowl commercial. I'd, I'd suggest you're in. Uh, otherwise, how do you afford it? Um, so it's so it's this so San Pellegrino is a lovely example of a of a costly signal to help you just like white gloves in a wedding dress. It's a little bit of investment to help you trust that what goes within the box, what's underneath the foil, is of is of quality. Otherwise, we wouldn't be protecting it. Um, it's a it's a lovely piece there. That is a really nice insight around the cost of marketing overall and the stuff that maybe doesn't drive clicks or conversions on the back end or whatever so with brands that i work with for the podcast or whatever they're looking to try and track whether or not people are interested in the products that i'm talking about and i'm like well i use them i would hope that the people that listen to yeah. the show are interested as well but a big chunk of it is well how do you put a value on being associated with jordan peterson's name or jocko willink's name or that the, these are the sort of brand associations that are very difficult to buy literally you can't buy them these people aren't for sale so yeah how do you try and quantify that well you don't does it show up on the balance sheet well i don't know maybe aggregated and smeared across the next five years across a bunch of purchases that are tiny little nudges towards decisions and blah blah but yeah it's it's very interesting thinking about that the other uh contradiction that i thought that was super interesting to me was improving experience without changing duration because our passive um subjective experience of time is something that i've always been pretty fascinated with and the way that we can speed that up and slow it down rory's example yeah. about the innovation of uber wasn't the fact that you could order it from anywhere it's that you knew how long it was going to be until the uh, taxi yeah. arrived i'm pretty sure that ogilvy was it you guys that got brought in to reduce complaints at security in Heathrow? And you did that by putting right. signs saying 60 minutes from here, 45 minutes from here, 30 minutes from here. And previously it was an engineering problem that was going to be, oh, we need to put, we can have a different type of scanning system and the belt can go at four miles per hour quicker and we'll have a whatever. No, it's not an engineering problem. It's a psychology problem. So using your new framework, your TRIZ mapped across onto psychology, what about experience and duration did you learn? Well, the, I mean, the first thing that I learned is what, is what you touched on in the beginning um, that was a fascinating part of research in the book was about the malleability of, of our experience of time. Um, all the way through to looking into species um, that a, a fly experiences time much faster than than we do, and a and a, and a whale experiences it more slowly than we do. How and did, it sort how of did makes they know sense. that? How do they know how fast? Well, so, so what or... they did. So have you ever seen? Have you ever seen like a um a TV being filmed by a camera? You know, and the camera picks up the flickers of a TV. Yeah. So, so if, uh, I don't understand the technology behind it, but the processing speed of the camera is maybe faster than this. So you, so you see what the eyes can't essentially. So what they did was they they put electrodes on a series of of many different animals, um, and and showed them different speeds of flickering light. And if if an animal could see the flicker, then that could show that their processing speed was faster. Right, um, because I think that's I think that and I don't know this as a fact, but I think they said the dogs might be able to see the flicker, but we can't see the flicker. So, so I'm not 100 percent on on that, but that's the that's the way in which they explored how, how they could do this. Um, and 
and it sort of it, it makes sense from an evolutionary perspective as well. Like it's no benefit for a whale to see the world faster than it can act upon. It, it, if it sees a, if a whale was to see the world as fast as a fly, it would just be like sort of depressed all the time because it can't do anything about it. Um, whereas a hawk needs to see the world faster than a whale because it can sort of action that. So, so having these differences in 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 the species um, experience of time is was I found a sort of a fascinating piece. But then when we look even within our own species, um, that time can be experienced very differently, and a couple of different things that. that that can change our experience of time, um, sort of novel events, stress and pressure, um, and familiarity. And, uh, and so the more familiar, as I said, we become earlier, sort of the more we begin to sw switch off, our attentional resources tend to go down. We don't tend to absorb as much information. Our brain is not taking as many photos all the time. It doesn't need to because we're in a, uh, we're, we're in a familiar environment. Whereas we're in a novel environment or under under stress and pressure or or in danger our brain's looking to capture every element to help us to survive and that 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 focus of resources extends our experience of time and they find this sort of experimentally through different paradigms one thing's called the oddball effect so you might see a series of cows flicking on a screen and then they'll throw up an apple in and people will say that the apple was on the screen longer than the cows. And it wasn't. It was the exact same time. But because your sort of brain starts to switch off and not need to read as much information of the cows, this new image of an apple sort of focuses your attention and, and, and stretches that time. Um, whereas we also can forget putting out the rubbish and catching up train for the gazillionth time. So I found that anyway, just broadly a, a fascinating area. So a couple of things um, that we look at. One is about expectation. Um, that be having an expectation of an outcome, we can change the experience duration. So um, if we're waiting um, without um, information on coming, then that time feels extended. I mean, we feel uncomfortable, we feel stressed, Therefore, we're laying more of these of these memories. The time feels it's sort of ex extended. Um, when we we are have an, a sense of expectation of what to experience, then that time goes faster. So one. And my partner and I were talking about this recently. Actually, we did a we did a it was a really dangerous bushwalk. We have a four year old and a one year old. We got we got sort of halfway and thought, "Geez, I wish we didn't do this." But on on the way back, we sort of thought that was faster than the way out. And there's it's called the return trip effect. And often people experience that the outgoing journey is longer than the the homeward journey. Um, so you might be, feel like it takes a long time to get to a particular destination, but it's faster coming back. And one of the the justifications for this is now we have set our expectations to how long the trip is. Um, we know how far we're going to go, so it's going to be faster when we're coming home again. So, so providing someone with a sense of expectation of outcome again, whether it's 60 minutes, 40 minutes, and we can start to, to shift that. I think um, in, in Disneyland, they, they tend to overinflate the expected times that say you wait for an hour, but it's really 40 minutes because you're just sort of shaping expectations. Um, so expectation management is, is, is the first. The, 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 the second is basically just engaging the brain um, with activity. So, so one of the biggest um, culprits of ex sort of du experience duration is boredom. And again, another fascinating um, one, whereas when we're bored, we often think that we're sort of just like doing nothing. But when we're bored, we're actually really stressed. Uh, our, our, our brain and our body is telling us to do something else. I mean, it's, it's, it's because we have less um, reproductive or social benefits of sitting there doing nothing. So when we're actually bored, we're really stressed. When we're stressed, time slows down. So it's like a double whammy. So just engaging the brain and whether that's the classic um, mirrors on a, in an elevator <laughs> that help people sort of do them to look at their makeup or do their tie. Um, that's uh, that's a, a great example of just engaging engaging the brain. And we can see elevators around the world putting in little games and things like that now, just to keep us occupied while we're waiting or while we're traveling. Now, all the way to the extreme of the Eurostar um, that um, created a, a, a wonderful AI mask for kids riding between London and Paris but as you go under the tunnel you put the sort of the, the, the mask on and um, and you're transported to this foreign world under this under the sea and before you know it you've popped up on the other side so rather than sitting there bored you're just sort of engaging the brain tricking it into the believing that it's experiencing some other sort of social social benefit um, and the last is looking at at the the 
what's known as the peak end effect, the, the peak and, and how, it, how it ends. And funnily enough, this was also brought up over the, over the last week with my partner when we talked about our, our trip and the, and the peak um, experience um, was certainly this bushwalk. But we tend to remember events based on their peak, how extremely positive or negative they are and, and how they end. Um, and so if we can start to manufacture more peaks and and positive endings and that's not necessarily lifting the average experience from a six to a seven that's fine like what are some opportunities to sprinkle in some more tens then we can again and um, boost the experience without actually changing its duration another nightlife example for you here please we, we used to do, so during the evening we would have an event schedule the schedule would be stuff like confetti drop at midnight and balloon drop at twelve thirty and stage games at one fifteen or whatever yes uh so that was peaks right and the peaks are often we leave that up to the dj mostly that combined with a little bit of production but one of the things we realized is if we gave people a little a little treat on the way out that would maximize the end effect as well because everybody has to leave and some people are leaving yeah. early because they've bagged off with a, a partner for the night or maybe because they've had a little bit too much to drink so they don't maybe need yes. one and we actually managed to combine two really great strategies here one of the issues you have in most cities is that nightclubs are not a million miles away from residential areas, and although the nightclubs themselves will be sufficiently soundproofed to avoid leakage going out above the decibel level that is for the noise pollution, you can't mandate the same for the people that leave. The patrons that leave go outside and they start doing football chants and they start screaming and shouting at each other and recording TikToks. So what we did to combine both of these was we gave people lollipops on the way out, just nice little lollipops, but and there was someone handing them to them rather than the bucket because the bucket just didn't feel like a, a nice experience. It was a pretty girl or a good-looking lad, and he would be handing out, oh, there you go, there's a lollipop. The lollipop was the end effect. It made them feel like they'd been well-treated. It was given out by somebody that left a good lasting impression, and because you're sucking yes. on a lollipop, you're not going to start chanting because you've got some sugar yes. in your mouth. Wonderful. So we managed to come up with a solution Perfect. for that as well. And that's a crack. And again, and this is why I find because I've I've not explored the the world of of, of optimizing an, an evening at a Sam, nightclub. Sam, you should and do. This a, is where you're missing. Now we should. But having having a balloon drop, I mean, that's a that's a that's a, a wonderful like again peak memorable moment. Oh fuck! Sorry, um, I got to give you another one. I got to give you another one. So please. imagine that you're in a big a, a a bigger club. We haven't done this for a while because you need a venue that's got a very high ceiling and a big dance floor. You'll remember if you're at a sports game and there is a single beach ball being batted around, you're more concerned with what's going on with the beach ball sometimes yes. than what's going on in the pitch. In the match. Yeah, so we realized that you could basically do the same thing and we uh, created, created, we stole this from a bunch of festivals, um, moderate weight balloons that are massive. They're sort of like bigger than a beach ball. I, couple of feet across we would inflate those and we would knock those out into the crowd and then we would light them from the back so that as you were seeing these balloons go through the air there were just these the club would be pretty dark except for some light striking the balloons and it was yes. just an unbelievable way to keep people occupied and you would yes. see exits would be reduced during that time what you're trying to do is not only get the crowd in but hold the crowd as well because you don't want people yes. to leave to go elsewhere and you would see the number of people going to the bathroom would be reduced the number of people that were leaving would be reduced because they were mesmerized and maybe they got Something the opportunity to hit it and yeah that was no it's cool it's a wonderful canvas uh, um to to consider and, and the more distinctive and fun again the more more memorable every car has a sports mode but only tesla has ludicrous mode i mean it's just uh, there's a in the book i write it's actually from um, chip and dan heath's um they they found it for 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 the power of moments it's a, it's a hotel in los angeles it's really a sort of a clapped up old 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 hotel it's called the magic castle hotel um, but it ranks supremely i've been there on, on have you been to the, the magic uh -huh. castle I hotel get, i managed to sneak myself an invite a few years ago perfect and and so so you'll know better than me then what they have is is, is a tell us what's the what's the most memorable feature of the magic castle hotel um you whisper to an owl to get in i think is it an owl i feel like it's a statue of an owl and you need to go up and whisper to it and then this sliding bookcase opens up uh, no phones, no nothing else. So that 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 created an anticipatory effect that oh, this is something that's special, it's confidential. Yes. Um, upon going in, maybe this is the owl. I can't remember. There's there's a thing that you can go and whisper a song to 
And if you whisper a song to it, the piano that has nobody sat in front of it starts playing the song that you just whispered. That was That's cool. That was pretty insane. I, I, there was just loads of stuff. I ended up getting pretty, uh, pretty drunk that night. So my my memory, <laughs> my memory as I get further into the evening becomes more hazy. But yeah, it was it was spectacular. But you're not worried. The most important thing is you're not worried about the thread count. You, you're not worried about sort of whether your towels are left on the hook or should I? You're in. It's it's. You're, you're thinking about. You're thinking about the the, the whispering owl, the, the 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 strange piano. There's a apparently there's a, a button beside the pool that you. Or there's a there's a phone, a little phone box that you you lift up and you ask. It's a pop popsicle hotline and if you lift up the phone someone a waiter with a with a sort of a, a, a silver platter will bring you a, a free popsicle to the pool so it's again it's just adding these moments of distinctiveness and 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 that boosts memorability and it's it's not again every touch point from six to seven it's finding these things that that that, that create more traction velcro for the brain i think maybe there's an argument to be made that malmaison have a good end effect to their customer experience i think that they literally had a sign below the toiletries saying the best toiletries that you'll ever steal yeah and there's another one it says the same from virgin atlantic on the on the bottom of this salt and pepper it says stolen from virgin atlantic and it's it's wonderful stuff and 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 it's it's and this is where I say there's sort of similar examples. You can have a popsicle hotline at the at the at the, the Magic Castle Hotel in LA. There's Bob Bob Rickards in Soho in London that has a press for champagne button. You know, it's really similar kind of concepts, but they just again they 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 spark the brain. They capture more memories, you know, and therefore they can start to shape the the memory of the experience rather than the 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 actual experience because we navigate by the memory of it not the 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 time itself i mean that's fleeting but how we recall it is 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 more powerful last thing um your lollipop solution there's another piece of innovation that you might have found that also you reduced fights um there's a, the evidence around sugar consumption and aggression particularly on alcohol i mean there's a there's a, a um a group of volunteers in in sydney called the red frog brigade and they walk around the nightclubs handing out red frogs just to sort of boost glucose what's levels. a red frog like a lolly? red frog or so maybe that's a, it's a lolly so it's a maybe it's an australia a classic australia it's like a like a lolly but again, having a bit of sugar doesn't just sort of stop the stop people from shouting. It probably actually stops people from from being aggressive. And maybe they're both connected anyway, because you're not yelling abuse at someone because you're sucking on a chopper chap. <laughs> Sam Tatum, ladies and gentlemen, if people want to check out the stuff that you do, where should they go? Uh, look at me on uh, on, on LinkedIn, uh, on on Twitter. I think it's S underscore Tatum, T A T A M. Uh, if you're interested, check out the book Evolutionary Ideas on Amazon. All good booksellers. Um, it's been a, a labour of love and and really fun to sort of talk through some of the elements of it. I've really enjoyed this conversation, mate. Thank you, Sam. I appreciate you. Cheers, mate. What's happening, people? Thank you very much for tuning in. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe. Peace.